The topic of today's session is navigating your employment offer. I'm very pleased to introduce Laurel Bellows, my friend and colleague who is the founding principal of the Bellows Law Group. Laurel counsels senior executives and corporations on employment, severance, change in control agreements, internal investigations, and business disputes. Laurel is the former president of the American Bar Association, the Chicago Bar Association, the Chicago Network, and the International Women's Forum. She currently serves on the global board of the International Women's Forum and is chair of its governance committee. Welcome, Laurel. Oh, so Kathy, thanks for that amazing introduction, right? And thanks for inviting me. I'm really excited to speak to all of you today. And the topic is negotiating an employment mm -hmm. offer. And I want to start out by the, the dream versus reality, of course, is what you're all experiencing right now. It's a really tough market out there to some extent, but I want to tell you that because I negotiate employment contracts and separation agreements every single day of my professional life that my desk is actually not weighted in one direction or another. So the good news I share at the beginning of this is I have offers that we're negotiating and I have separation, this restructuring that you've been through and, the, and what you're about to go through very quickly, which is taking a look at an employment offer. And the timing of today is so important. So please feel free to shoot questions as we go. I'll either answer them if they're, you know, right, right then, as soon as Kathy interrupts me, which I told her was fine, because my job today is to answer your questions and speak to the issues that you want to hear about. But we all know what we want. So I'm going to be telling you what it is you're looking for in an offer, maybe more than compensation alone. So that's the dream part. And then we're going to talk about getting to the reality of the offer and understanding, particularly today, that a lot of you get an offer and you say, fabulous, I'm taking it. The answer is yes. And you don't even really focus on some of the important parts of the offer. So I'm going to do something a little unusual. We're going to talk about the offers themselves. If we have time, I have a couple of negotiating tips for you that will kind of squeeze in. You'll be receiving my bullets in the by email, which will be a negotiation reminder, not a reminder of the offers only, but a negotiation reminder of some of the tips for getting to where you want to be. But today I'm going to do what my mom does when I was little, and she used to serve me dessert first. Okay, so I want to point out to you that one of the most important areas of your negotiation of an employment offer is your exit. This is a prenuptial agreement, if you want to talk about it in those terms. Your termination was a divorce. It had all the signs, you know, the negotiation, the a little bit of anger and, you know, unfairness and want for vengeance, perhaps, and a lot, and perhaps disagreement and, and surprise and all of the things that, and feeling vulnerable and being out there, all of the things that go with the divorce. Now we're switching gears and we're talking about the prenup, the walking down the aisle conversation. If you think about this, what happens when you get an offer, as I said, is you want to walk down that aisle. These are the good times. Somebody really credible is offering you a chance to join them and grow with them. That's the employment. But trusting them today is not the same as trusting them on separation. You must always look to what severance and exit policies are and negotiate a deal for your severance now because the time to negotiate is at the time of your offer. What is your severance policy? What do you do for people like me who might only be with you for 10 years? And if you're giving two weeks a year, that means I get 20 weeks and I'm a senior executive officer that generally would receive uh, a year in severance. And you're coming out of where you were. You know what your severance negotiations were like at that time. So you have a real sense for what a fair policy would be as it relates to you. If they say no and they totally refuse to negotiate, of course, you can call me and we can talk about how to get around that. But it's at least a try that's more than a try. I mean, a very serious negotiating request. You are going to leave your new job. You're going to leave it because they say goodbye to you and they're restructuring or there's a change in control, just like you went through. 
you're going to leave because you get another offer down the road uh, and you leave voluntarily where you're going to leave most of your benefits and equity on the table because you're leaving. And we'll talk about at the very beginning again, when I go back, we'll speak about make whole agreements, but goodness knows you are going to die. And maybe hopefully before that, you're going to retire. So there is exit absolute. That's the only absolute in all of this is you are going to be leaving the company that you're joining today. So let's figure out what their policy is and then what you're asking for. The ask has to do with your restrictive covenants. So that's why we're putting these together. And then we'll go back up and take a look at the offer from the beginning. My two most important features of looking at and negotiating an offer. There is going to be a non-compete, a non-solicitation of customers and consultants, a non-solicitation of employees, somewhere hidden or forthright. You wanna know if you are going to be asked to sign a separate right, confidentiality, non-disclosure, non-compete, non-solicitation. Wouldn't it not please you if you accepted the offer, you went to work, and then somebody put all right, a non-compete agreement in front of you to sign after you've accepted the job? That is not what you want to happen. You want to question whether your equity agreements have non-competes in them. That's generally where they're hidden, right? Because they give you stock or equity in return for uh, signing a non-compete or a restriction on your future employment. But we are talking about restrictions on your future employment that are binding. They are enforceable in Illinois and most states. The only place a non-compete is not enforceable is in California. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, you can work for a company that's based in California. And if you don't work literally in California, non-compete agreements are enforceable and they need to be reasonable. Uh, but they have clauses, employment agreements have clauses that say this non-compete agreement, which is for 100 years is it, and keeps you from competing in any place at any time about anything, right? If, if you are being asked to sign something really outrageous, that is, leaves you unable to work again, that agreement probably is not enforceable. So what you're negotiating right up front is one, asking what restrictions there are on your future employment, and then matching that with your severance policy, because if they're asking you to, to sign a non-compete for a year, your severance should be at least a year with insurance, medical insurance coverage. If they're asking you to sign a non-compete for three months, well, then you might wanna consider accepting three months of exit, although I would not suggest you do that but at least your non-compete restrictions that keep you from working in an area in which you have expertise, those restrictions should match your severance because you're gonna be put on the beach in some cases. Next, looking at your non-compete, there are ways of narrowing a non-compete that I wanna to talk to you about. And these discussions will happen at your exit perhaps at the time, maybe have happened with you already recently, Right, but our best happening right now while you're negotiating that offer. So you have a huge company and you're going to be working as CFO of a business unit. You may not see the, the data on any other division of that huge company. So you can argue that the only competition that you might be subject to is a competition relating to what your division is producing, the, the documents and the data and the finances of the division in which you are working. And so you could go to work for another large company or for a small company, as long as you are not working for in, in opposition to the company who's in the process of paying you severance. That's what they don't like. It's not, it is not only, and you're CFOs, so you know what the company, you know, put your company hat on and uh, sit on the other side of the table for a little bit and think about what would be reasonable to negotiate because this non-compete is too broad for what they need from you. You don't have information or confidential or otherwise, you aren't client facing. Right. And you aren't the COO, you're the CFO. So you don't have direct um, 
contact with clients. You might with some consultants, but not consultants who are in the sales side of business or the marketing side. So you can you can negotiate that you can go to a larger company and work for a division that does not compete. All right? And if you have a specialty like healthcare or travel um, or any particular area where the financing hotels, um, although you know, I doubt anybody's hiring right now, but I want to talk to you about that in a second. Uh, then that restriction, all right, is competitive and it's fair, but you can still take a look at how long it is, but you can also, you can also ask to restrict it to exactly the work that threatens their business and their revenue. And if there is none, then you, you shouldn't have to be restricted from that. You can also indicate that if there is a teeny, teeny, teeny little slice of the work that your company that's offering you employment does, all right, say it's less than 10% of their business, then you might say, I can go to somebody, all right, who competes with this less than 10% because it's not going to hurt your business in any way. These are not customers you're going after. My marketing or whatever financial knowledge I have about your plans for restructure otherwise is not going to affect this company. Not only am I never going to share it because I have a confidentiality agreement and I wouldn't share, but even if I did, it wouldn't hurt anything. So those are the two areas that we can spend some more time on uh, if we have time and your questions might be directed there at something you're looking at right now. But I wanted to highlight that to you, bring it up front, because as I say, this is prenuptial. Prenuptial means everything looks good and everybody loves each other while you're walking down the aisle. You can't really know what the culture is. You can't really know what these people are like, no matter how much preparation you do by asking around until you go to work there. You don't even really know other than seeing, you know, I assume that you've seen the financials, right? But you don't even know if they're accurate. I'm, I'm representing somebody right now who took on a pretty big job in the financials. This person was given for a CFO role. It was not a public company. They, they were inaccurate. There were reasons for it. but this CFO was brought in uh, basically to do a turnaround as opposed to uh, establishing a growth model. And that's a, different, that's a different job. So you wanna look at everything you can. Let's start right at the beginning then and say to you, if I'm not negotiating only compensation, Laurel, what am I talking about? Well, CFO, big letters, right? CFO, of small company, CFO, large company, CFO, division, all right, CFO, private equity holding, CFO, private equity um, business, all right, the revenue generating portion of the business, CFO is your title. It may also, okay, need an additional title because you want to be on the executive leadership team. You don't want somebody telling you what to do without you knowing, and you want to be able to contribute. You want to have direct uh, reporting, which is the next, so there they are very, very much combined. You want to have the opportunity to be on the leadership team, to be able to contribute, to assist the company, that your ideas are going to be heard, that you have the authority to execute those ideas. That's really important when you're CFO. All right. If you just have a title, but you don't have real authority, let's say that the CEO doesn't delegate. So you have this title, but without um, checking in with that CEO and the board every minute, you don't have the authority to execute and implement what you think needs to be done. So when you're talking about title, look at who your peers are. So you want to make certain that you are a peer of the person who's bringing in revenue. So if they're, if they're looking at a peer that's a business unit president, then you wanna make certain, uh, are you going to be peer um, with a chief of human resources or is human resources reporting into you? Communications and marketing, are you a peer or are they reporting into the chief of HR? Who is on the leadership team? Who is your peer? Ask them to identify that. And if there's an SVP or an EVP title in a company's CFO, 
you should be negotiating for that title right now as you enter. I think all of you recognize right, that that's the hardest part to negotiate after you're in. It's something worth fighting for, for the reasons I said, access to the decision makers, presentations to the board, uh, and uh, the authority to accomplish what you've been given to do, and the authority to set objectives for others and for yourself. So title and reporting could be some of the most important negotiations that you 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 do and it's it is not necessarily going to be the most controversial unless and this is where trust your gut unless they fight very hard so who had the position before you and what was their title and to whom were they reporting and were they on the executive leadership team the response could well be these people were with us for 20 years. And so, yes, they're on the executive leadership team and they were reporting directly to the CEO, but we're not going to do that with you. Well, that would be a big mistake for you to accept a, a job without really pressing to see how you're going to be recognized and why, all right, you wouldn't qualify for that title now if you're being asked to do the same job that somebody did who's just either been asked to leave and left. And of course, you want to figure out why they left. Right? So if you have access to that person and the ability to speak to them, all right, you might actually speak to them about how it was to work in the culture of this company in the position that you're looking for. So you can always ask if it's a recruiter. Of course, you can ask who was there and uh, are you and when you get further down and you've received an offer, are you able to, just like they're checking your references, you have the right to check the references of the company you're about to join. Uh, and, and I would strongly suggest that you do that unless there's a real pushback. And if there is, press a little bit to find back, you know, find out why, because they can say our relationship with this person is not good. We left on bad terms. And you say, okay, I understand that. But there's information I can get there. Everybody, you know, I'm, I'm not interested in the history of why somebody left necessarily, but I am interested in the description of what it's like for me to walk in and begin work and carry on my work in this environment in which I'm not sitting. So that's important. The title and the reporting, of course, also goes to what kind of a team you have. And you are going to be asking on that offer, not only, um, you know, what the finances look like, but what's your individual CFO budget and, and what's, you know, what is the performance of the team you're leading and what are the expectations of that team, all right, that you're responsible for delivering. And, you know, do you have a severance pot, basically, and in this time of restructure? Are you, is there anybody that's sacrosanct? You certainly can answer, you ask that question. So, you know, is there somebody who's, um, who has performance issues that you've already been looking at that we're going to need to replace? That would be jointly. HR, you know, has a record of some non-performance issues. Is there anybody that the CEO or any HR has, has um, already identified as not to not being a keeper. So you be, you should be talking about that upfront to make certain that you have your own budget for restructure of necessary and reorganizing your team, just like any other senior officer would. Now going through these issues, I am actually talking about any employment offer at the senior, le senior, senior level or at the mid-level. And I'm also talking about any offer from a small business, large business, private business, public business, private equity. The only thing that's going to be differing here when we talk about private equity, and there's a lot of those offers on the street right now, is the equity vesting, the benefits, the make whole, so, and maybe even the restrictive covenants. So everything here has a different, there's a different conversation for private equity because your compensation is going to be lower on cash and heavy on equity. And your biggest question when, when reviewing an offer for private equity is, is this worth it? If I'm getting $100,000 or $50,000 less to go to private equity and hoping that the equity I'm receiving will vest, that I will be around for it to vest or around for the liquidity event, which will pay out, then will the five or seven years of losing fifty dollars or $100,000 a year be paid off? So you're going to be doing a calculation on private equity going into our conversation on base and bonus. So when somebody offers you less than you think that your, your 
excuse me, your job is worth and less than you think you're worth at this time, you need to do the math to say this turnaround is not going to happen for seven or 10 years if it's a startup. If they're well into um, the business, then it might be a three or five year wait. It's an easy calculation to take three or five times the difference between what you're asking for in base in public or non-private equity deals. So let's say that you're asking for 350 or 250 and they're offering you 150 or 250 and there's $100,000 difference times five years, right? That's a half a million dollars. Are you going to vest? Well, we are going to talk about when in equity vesting in a second that nothing's secure and very, <laughs> very few of the private equity deals turn into a really viable money-making change of control. So you have to be very careful about what compensation you're willing to give up uh, before joining a private equity company. So now, and the bonuses in private equity are, are very often, if there are bonuses, they are not cash bonuses in most cases. So uh, let's take a look at base bonus just generally. And that would be, okay, how much are you paying me? Uh, what's my target bonus? Now, we all know that target bonus is discretionary. So just because you have negotiated for a 30% target or a 50% target or a 75% target doesn't mean you get that. I mean, it's certainly clearer today than it was eight months ago that target bonus disappears immediately first to go and then a cut in base comes based on the COVID disasters that we're facing. But at least when you're negotiating your base, there are comparables. There are comparables out there, or there are people who you can pay to help you, not very much money, but you can pay to get the non-public information, or you can ask around because your peers here at FEI are the ones who are going to have some of the most important information that could possibly have, all right? They're helping you network and get your job, and they also have a real sense of what they were receiving and what their peers were receiving outside in the market. So you're, you're in a wonderful world here at FEI, as you know, because you can use that networking for different reasons. And this would be, hey, guys, I got an offer, all right? What's my base? What's my bonus out there in the world? And I think you've already done that, but you're not going to depend on the recruiter to give you that information. The recruiter might give you a range, all right? And of course, then anybody who gives you a range is willing to pay the higher end of that range. So don't make a mistake about going in lower than the higher end of that range, all right? If I say to you, oh, you know what? Um, this job offers between 175 and 225. Do I? ever think that I'm asking for anything less than 225 because that would never ever come out of that recruiter's mouth if 225 weren't on the table for you 225 plus All right, so let's let's talk about that negotiation certainty the next would be that target bonus is something that's a, a little bit more negotiable because it's still discretionary so you're saying okay you want to pay me a little bit less base then I want my target bonus to be higher. And if we don't earn the target, we don't earn the target. But the fact is, as a CFO is what you're saying, I'm going to be doing my job round the clock, whether the revenue folks are doing their job or not. I understand that I'm a senior officer and I'm going to suffer whatever my senior officers suffer. And I'm a team player. But my bonus needs to be based on something other than sales. All right. My bonus has to be based on what I'm doing for you, how I'm saving you money, restructuring, finding areas of revenue that haven't been uh, looked at, having conversations with the re revenue folks, the sales guys and the marketing guys to indicate where the gaps are and give them as much information as I possibly can in real time. I'm making their job easy in a tough market, but I'm not going out and actually selling. I don't face the clients. So how about considering a bonus and objectives that are centered on the job that I actually will be doing for you and can accomplish for you. So when you're negotiating base and bonus, you need to think about exactly where in this particular business you are most valuable because you are an expense item unless you're working to bring in revenue in your own way taking a look at what, what revenue was last year in a company that you're not doing business with this year, that should be the job of marketing sales. 
But if you were to come and bring that to, to the sales attention, just say, you know, it looks like we've got a downward trend in this area of our business. Right? I know you're looking at it. Let's see if I can't help you figure out like where it might be coming from and how we can position somebody to go back in there. That's your job to, you know, to do the to do the face, the face work and the background for that face work. But it's my job to highlight it for you so that you can see it in this busy time when you have all kinds of other crises going on and your sh- your staff is short. So that might be something that you could do to indicate you know, that you are a team player. Bonuses, bonuses. In an offer, it's not all about money. It's when it gets paid. So generally, let's just take a, a fiscal year of um, December thir- ending December 31. You work all year until December 31, but we know that in many cases, most cases these days, public or private, all right, the bonus is not paid until March or April. When the close comes, and everybody else, and and the equity is not granted, but your employment offer, I'm guaranteeing you says, if you are not there when the bonuses are paid, if you are not employed at the time of bonus payment, you don't get bonus. So you need to be negotiating something that is simple, but often pressed back. If I get a pro rata bonus for the year of my termination, we're back to a negotiating exit. If I work all that time and bring you value, then you should be paying me a bonus whether or not I'm there on March or April 15 when you pay bonuses. You don't have to pay it till March or April when everybody else gets their bonus. That's a different conversation. But you do have to pay me when you pay everybody else. If you've worked a half a year, you can ask for a pro rata bonus payable at the time that other people are paid. If you don't ask for that, the bonus policy that's the plan, the bonus plan, or if it's a smaller company, the policy is you will not get paid a bonus. So you say, you know, you could fire me without cause on December 15. You could actually fire me without cause on December 29. And then I would not get my bonus. You could fire me on January 1st after the entire year is completed, right? And I will not get my bonus for the year of termination if you fire me and I'm not there. And that's not right. Let's work it out right now and let's put a promise in writing into our agreement. I need to know how we're doing on time. So I'm looking below. Okay. Uh, Equity vesting. Big topic. So you're happily employed and you are doing an amazing job. What about what about the equity you're receiving that vests these days, sometimes after three years, you know, three-year vests every annually, but more often four years. And I often am starting to see people ask for uh, employers ask for a five-year vest. That's too much, all right? If it's a small enough company where it's not for everybody and you're a senior officer, including private equity, you want want a three-year vest, you want a four-year vest, but you do not want a five-year vest, 20% a year for five years. And of course, you understand that hopefully you're getting more equity, all right, every year as a bonus. And so that's their golden handcuff as to what vests and what doesn't. But beware again of private equity because They are not going to give you more equity unless you indicate that you believe that the sign-on grant that we we will talk about, about negotiating in a second, that that sign-on grant is not the only grant you will receive, that you will be receiving bonuses in the form of equity. So one, private equity deals. Are you going to be paying bonus? Even small private companies, are you going to be paying a bonus? And am I going to be participating in the growth of the company? Small companies, private companies, that's a question you need to be asking. Am I going to be participating? I'm a senior officer. They say, well, this is a family owned. We, you, can't part, you can't be an owner. They just say, that's fine. But I, I should be receiving some form of profit unit, some form of phantom equity. I'm, 
I'm thinking most of you know what I'm saying and that we can hold off for questions, but phantom equity basically saying, I'm coming into the company at a certain valuation. And when I leave that company, we will determine what the valuation is of the company at the time I leave. And I will get some percentage of the difference in that valuation, gross, net, all right, EBITDA, whatever the measures, they should be the same measure for the coming in as the going out valuation. It could be a 409 cap A valuation, uh, whatever it is in a private company of any kind, there are ways of your participating in the growth of the company other than actually getting a piece of the company, particularly in a family company where they're not gonna sell. So that piece of the company is basically worthless to you because you never, ever, ever will get it bought out at the increased value. So you're negotiating for some form of participation, which you will receive at some future point in time that reflects the work that you've done. If you're not getting cash bonus or in addition to cash bonus, or the same for whatever make whole bonus sign on that you receive. So equity vesting for private equity is very tough because you're going to see that it's often not, uh, it might be vested, but it's not paid out until a liquidity event. So again, as we talked about at the very beginning on the restrictive covenants and the exit, exit in a private equity company is, is usually a call on your equity by the company. They can just say, okay, you can't continue to hold these shares, so we're calling them. And we will pay you current fair market value, not what you would receive at the profitable end when there's a change of control and a liquidity event, but current fair market value. And that conversation, one, is how does it, how is it determined? Two, who has the authority to determine it? Always the management in their discretion. So you are not going to be receiving value in a private company based on anything other than what the owners determine is the value of the company until there's a change of control. So we will talk about this more if we have time and if you want me to. I think that this is an area in which we need to focus because I think a lot of you are are taking positions in private companies, family owned companies. There's a distinction. It can be private without being family owned. Private, family owned, and they may not have any incentive plan at all which means you can't count on getting any bonus or vesting of equity or participation in the tremendous work that you've done, or they have, um, was that you, Kathy, who wanted to come ask me something? We have a couple questions, Laurel, is it? I, and we might, you know, and I think we're going to get plenty time. more. So why don't we, okay. So uh, a comment was restrictive covenants equal non-compete agreements. Any other restrictions? Yes. All right. So restrictive covenants are, as we said, the non the actual non-competition. You cannot work in a business that does what we do. That's a non-compete. The non-solicitation that goes with it often says you cannot uh, solicit business or work for a company where they are serving our clients but you cannot, you cannot diminish the business that any client does with us. Again, from a CFO perspective, Kathy, this doesn't make a lot of sense. It probably isn't something that the CFO worries about, but it also says you cannot use consultants that you've been depending on because we don't, one, they have our private information, but two, we don't want them to tell your new company anything about our company, and we don't want them to share the advice they've given to us. So it often says consultants and clients, but the, uh, and sometimes banks or anybody who has personal information. The other part of a restriction that everybody has is a confidentiality agreement. There are also, by the way, I'm not going to spend time on it, but there are parameters for people who are working in the intellectual property industry or are working for a company with tremendous um, interest in intellectual property, either preserving their own or buying it, all right, or litigating it. So you want you want to think about work for hire and uh, inventions and other things that might affect you in some way, but CFO, again, probably not. 
So what we're talking about confidentiality is everything that you know about the company, anything that you've learned that the public does not know. And that means for infinite time, there is, we used to do confidentiality agreements for three or four or five years because we would say by that time, that information is useless. And now you don't see that. You see confidentiality. If it was confidential and it remains confidential and it's not in the public arena, then it remains confidential forever and you can never disclose. Very interesting piece of this. If you go to work for a company that does compete after your non-competition restriction is over, you're not violating, but in your head, you're bringing along information that's very valuable to the other company. You have to be very, very careful about how you disclose all right, that you might be using the information in your brain that you just can't separate out. So please be careful not to say something like, well, in my prior job, this is what we did. You just simply want to, in, when you're working, okay, you want to simply take that confidential information that you're about to share and say, how do I really know this? Did I know this? Is this, is this a precept of my business? Did I know this before I came to the business? And how do I disclose this or suggest a change that I know as a CFO needs to be made here, even if I might have learned about it someplace else? Just don't reference back. All right. You have your brain. It is your brain. You get to take it with you. But on the piece of paper that they often give you that says, what else do you have? If you don't have inventions, you just say um, you, you indicate um, information that you have beef and information that is practical to your business that you have in the normal course of your education and your experience so that they, and they won't, they rarely do, but they don't get really angry at you and come and say, that might not have been a non-competition, but it was a breach of confidentiality. So there's that non-disclosure, confidentiality, invention, IP piece that's in a lot of the restrictive covenants. But also in the restrictive covenants, there's that time um, there are also areas um, that we could talk about because I'm starting to see in banks, particularly, uh, they're giving garden leave, which means you cannot speak to any of your clients or people and in the securities business for six months, garden leave. They might be giving you a wonderful notice of 90 days or 180 days, but they're keeping your hands off clients. Again, for those of most of you who are CFO, that may not matter to you right? because you're not needing to go to a job that's client facing. But so it may not matter to you that for six months, if you sign that garden leave, which is scary, if any of your friends are going to work for banks or securities firms, please have them, have them give me a call because garden leave looks very pretty but you have to write in the exceptions to it um, regarding the clients or the contacts that you have right now um, and that you had before you went to work um, for the company you're about to go to work for. So what else do you have there? Great points, great. So uh, next question is, is the offer letter legally, by, is it a legally binding agreement in the sense that it overrides company policies and, or is it just a catalyst for the discussion and probably for you to structure a separate agreement? So there, yeah, there's no yes or no here. Okay. So, so an offer letter can absolutely be an agreement. If you sign it and they sign it, it's a short agreement. So you want to be very careful. It is enforceable and it most likely doesn't contain the protections that you need. So if you're seeing a one page, one and a half page offer, um, you might see an offer that reflects back to the policies that says you will be bound by our bonus incentive plan. You will be bound by our confidentiality agreement. You will be bound. So you need to be asking for every one of those agreements before you sign the offer so that you can look and see what they are. But the ideal way is for us to draft a, uh, or for me to tell you what needs to go into a written agreement which doesn't have to be 40 pages. It could be a three-page letter. It could be in a form of a letter. It's just that it says what your bonus is. It says that, that when that bonus is going to be paid. It says what your separation is. And it doesn't just simply reflect to their policies. As to the question about whether the policies bind 
or the employment offer binds? That's one of the best questions I've, I hear. So thank you. It, whatever you sign is binding, all right? If there are policies and there is no reference to the policies in your agreement, those policies will govern side by side with the agreement and they will supersede unless it says in your agreement, your offer agreement, that this is the agreement and this agreement will govern regardless of whatever policies are out there. So the company wants to set no new precedent. They have built a roster of policies and those are the ones that are in place and will govern unless exceptions to those policies are incorporated into your letter or your agreement and there's a huge and, picture this and like with capital A, capital N, capital D, included in your offer, letter, or agreement. And that agreement says that that offer agreement will be binding and govern your employment, no matter what the policies say in conflict. So that's the only way that you can be certain as to well, and I think that, you know, that's a reason, just a comment from my perspective, why, you know, especially with our executive outplacement candidates, I always advise and refer them to Laurel, you shouldn't, you shouldn't just automatically sign that agreement, right? It's the first step, it needs to be reviewed, and all of these negotiation items taken into account. Um, so thank you, Laurel, for that. Another yeah, question, uh, another question, go ahead, Laurel. Yeah, no, that's huge advice, Kathy. And I, you know, you're one of the few outplacement firms. <laughs> you might be the only one that actually says, "Don't just take it and sign it." It's not, you know, that's that is negotiable. I mean, it's negotiable. If they determine that they don't want to negotiate, then we get to the end of this conversation. Are we accepting this offer? But it's negotiable, and you're 100 percent right. No reflex signing in joy with champagne next to your pen. Well, I pen. think people get, you know, there's. Uh, uh, some anxiousness around it. It's, you know, if, if I try to negotiate, will they pull it? And no, you know, certainly if it's done professionally in the right way and at your level, it really ref it reflects your business savvy for even having that kind of conversation come up. So I would encourage you to do it. Uh, I love that point too, Kathy, because I mean, imagine you're the CFO of a company and there's an offer out for you know, one of your top positions, or you're being asked to interview for the, you know, to help interview for a senior leadership role. And you're going to be a part of some of those negotiations. You've, you've got the finances, you know, what can be, you know, what's afforded and what the policy is. So imagine somebody who comes in at your level and says, thank you. You know, just signs, doesn't even question the offer, doesn't, I mean, how do you read them as being a detailed, strong, both negotiator on behalf of the company, but also on behalf of themselves, what are they going to do when they get in a situation where they have to negotiate for the company? So there's nothing wrong with very nicely saying, these are the things, these are my priorities. And you should be doing that within the offer framework. Uh, when you're on your second or your third off, um, interview, you should be placing some priorities into that interview conversation. I love my clients who come to me before they get the offer. And they say, I'm talking and it looks serious, Laurel. I've interviewed with three or four people and it looks like they like me. I want to talk to you. And my, my next advice is let's talk about what those priorities are. So you can say, you know, in this world, cash is king to me. I have a family. I'm putting two kids through college. So, when, you know, if you were to consider me, I just want to tell you that, um, you know, there are things, you know, I'd appreciate it if you come to me before you run this offer up the ladder because mm -hmm. once they run the offer up the ladder, right, Kathy, they've got an approval from the top and they're going to be embarrassed if you don't accept it. So well, especially when, there's board, especially when there's board input involved. So right. great point. Okay. Uh, next question. Traditionally for large and mid, and mid cap uh, company stock options, vesting policies are hard coded and not subject to negotiations. Should the discussion and the negotiation be focused on sign-on bonus? Well, first of all, it's not true that the non-compete is hard-coded and not subject to uh, some form of negotiation. If they want you, and they do because they're giving you an offer, and they will not take the offer away, it would be very, very unusual in my 
umpteen years of negotiating <laughs> employment agreements, I have had only one deal where they took the offer away, but it had to do with finding out something about the candidate that they hadn't understood before. And as a result, they didn't not hire, they hired, but under different parameters because of this new information. So if you're handling this professionally, you are, and you're talking about why you need to negotiate, just not unilaterally saying, pound me the table and say, I deserve X, Y, and Z. Just say, you know, I was hoping for, or this medical insurance. Um, so how about I have, a, I have a child that's ill and needs care over, you know, for life. So if you're separating me and you don't want to talk about severance, I need you to talk about medical because I don't want to go on COBRA and use it up. What happens if it takes me more than 18 months to find a job? I can't be without medical insurance. So please at least cover my insurance and keep me as some form of active employee so that I can have insurance. Everything is negotiable until they say no more, no more. Then you get it. You say, okay, the make whole, of course, you're leaving something on the table and you know, and, and you left it on the table. We often use make whole for equity that would vest if you are already leaving a company and have left the company. So you have already forfeited that. But the make the make whole, the sign on bonus these days is based on one we want you very much. If you've got more than one offer, and you're consider and you're weighing it, then you're just you're basically saying sign on bonus vested over a certain period of time. Pardon me. But okay. your make whole bonus is exactly what that is. It's to make you whole for what you left behind, what you are leaving behind, generally job from a job. I'm leaving this job and I'm coming to you. And so I want you to make me whole for the equity that I'm leaving behind, the fact that I won't get a bonus this year, et cetera. But you're also negotiating for a guaranteed bonus for the year of first year of employment. So if you've got a 30% or a 40% target, it's very fair to say that's my ramp up here. So I want to know that at least for 2020, which has six more months in it, and you are only going to have like five months, I get into holiday time, you're only going to have five months of business to, to weigh my contribution to the company. I very much like either a guaranteed pro rata bonus, half of my bonus, or I'd like a guaranteed whole bonus for that year because I'm unable to, I won't have earned it. And that, you know, that's a big sign-on benefit. Um, and you're also negotiating perhaps uh, as sign-on, uh, again, not necessarily cash, but the vesting of some of your equity on termination. So you could, you could negotiate right now for the vesting, pro rata vesting of equity that you would otherwise forfeit entirely. So if I have a three-year grant or a four-year grant and I've worked two years and it's a cliff grant, you could, you know, you could actually say, I want to vest two years pro rata of the number of amount of time that I've been here. If you say goodbye to me so fast that I don't have a chance to vest in anything. Those are negotiable now. They're also negotiable at exit. Much easier to know what you're getting and not have to negotiate when everybody's not so thrilled about the starting date. Okay, great, great, great point. So I think here's another question that's top of mind for everyone. Do you see candidates having leverage in asking for these type of revisions, especially in you know, the current labor market and COVID situation? How do companies typically react to some of these requests? Well, and first of all, it's all about time, but you need to get paid for who you are. This is the only time that you're going to be able to set your value. After this, it's incrementally changed. Your base may never change. It may not go down, but right now we're seeing the fact that across the board, diminishment of salary and bonus. And so mm -hmm. with that, yours is going to go down as well. Executive leadership team, often the first, sometimes the only, to show everybody that they're suffering because at the same time, they're, restruct they're restructuring and saying goodbye, not just cutting salaries, but saying goodbye to a whole raft of people. And unfortunately, some of you are, are part of that and understand it. So you need to negotiate now for what your job pays. You do need to be cognizant of what's happening right now with the senior leadership team. Let's say that they've agreed to a 10 or a 20% diminishment in their rate of pay for now. 
So what you can say is, I'll accept this now, but when everybody, as part of the team, but when everybody else goes back, I want to go back to X. So you can negotiate two levels of compensation, today's COVID level, and then exactly what everybody else um, gets, particularly, that's why it's so important, so important to figure out who your peer is and make sure that that peer is very well thought of by the board and the CEO before they, you use them for a peer for compensation purposes. So uh, people are out there. Some of them, a lot of restructuring folks has to do with the fact that there's a new person on the block, all right? There's a new CEO, there's a new CFO, there's a new general counsel, and they wanna build their own team. So they've said goodbye to you and to others. It doesn't mean you're any less driven, any less competent. It just means the new team and the new person wants to choose their own team. Just like I said at the beginning, you're gonna to wanna to choose your own team. So be certain to have that conversation. You are in a time when people are looking for the cream and you're selling the cream. So if you are basing your interview and you're receiving the offer, and you're receiving an offer. So you are the cream. You're their first choice. They are going to answer you to no, they're not, or yes, they are. You could say, if you're not going to negotiate bonus today, I would like to have it in writing that we will renegotiate and reevaluate bonus in a year when things hopefully are calmer and, and our business has settled in. Or you could say, you know, I, this is the bonus I think I should have, but I'll take a cut this year. There's lots of negotiating that could show you're a team player, but that you want to be uh, receiving the compensation that pays you what you your value is worth and pays you at a level of your peers within that organization. So I think that's... I think that's great advice. I mean, the second part of this question was how do you recommend candidates position the discussion when the ask is more than they typically give? you. You've given some good examples, and I know just from working with Laurel, there is nobody better than coaching executives on the tone and how to set the conversation. So thank you for that, Laurel. But any other, you know, any other comment around that? How would you recommend they position the discussion? Well, they're positioning the discussion really no differently than they're positioning themselves when they have an offer, you know, when they're looking for the offer. But and and that's why I say when you're having interviews. You want to be talking to me or somebody else or your or your own peers so that you make certain that you aren't positioning just to get the job. You are positioning yourself for the type of compensation you think you should be earning. You don't even have to say the word money. All right. You just you're just giving examples of areas in which you contributed in an extraordinary way and commitment and the kind of time you put in and the and the. Um, the changes, let's say you've been through a change of control, let's say you've been through a liquidity event, you know, all of that you would probably put on your resume, but you may not highlight what went into that and what you contributed to that initiative other than to say, well, I have experience with A, B, and C. That's the kind of experience you break down because that's value and that has money attached to it um, in somebody's mind. I want this person and I'm willing to pay for them. It's really not a lot different than in the other times, except your competition is a little tougher. But when you're getting the offer, that competition is behind you. That offer is going to stick and stay until they find that they, you know, that you disagree or you walk. So I want to switch to this slide for a second because sure. you know, just a couple of negotiating tips. Don't get caught. And if you're working with Kathy, you will never get caught doing this. But if but don't get caught talking only to the recruiter, first of all, because you know, Kathy will be giving you advice as to when that you can ask to speak directly to the person who has the authority to make the decision. So if you're speaking internally to a lower level HR person, they don't have decision-making authority. So they're gonna go up the ladder to get the authority. Wouldn't you be better off? talking directly to the person for whom you're going to work, with whom you're going to report, and who is going to be the decision maker, so that you can communicate your value, your desires to the person who will make the decision. And then please remember that many things are subject to board approval. And that is always a dangerous piece because the CEO might have the authority, but that CEO is going to say, well, there's this, but I'm going to take it to the board and then come back and say, the board said to me that they should, we shouldn't pay you more than 25% less than the CEO was even suggesting. So 
it could be renegotiation or it could be truly the board looking at what's happening and you'll have you can ask that very directly or if the ceo is taking your compensation up to the top first of all you ask the ceo who has authority here is it the chief of human resources you ask the, the chief of human resources you know who's paying my you know comes out of somebody's budget i would think that the person that i work for or report to or the company generally is going to my salary my benefits my equity vesting come out of their budget they're going to have the authority to say yay or nay on anything i'm asking so i'm not going to waste a lot of time speaking to a lower level hr person the chief of hr you need to say do you have authority to make this deal with me because you're going to be his or her peer so who does and who is going to take this to the board with a recommendation to hire me on this level? So if it has to go to the board, you're asking, will you be recommending that the board accept these terms? If they're just going to go and, and kind of pass it in and let the board do whatever they want, that's not, that's not going to be helpful to you. So are you going to present this to the person who has authority if I can't talk to them directly? And you would probably never, well, you might actually, your CFO, you might very well meet the board and you might want that opportunity. You're going to be dealing with them frequently. In a private equity company, they're going to be asking a lot of you. So you, you, you again, you probably want to be meeting with, and I assume that you will be meeting with the, the heavy investors and those investors are seated on the board. So essentially, you're meeting with the board and the board chair. You want to know if the board chair is different than the CEO. So again, who has the authority? Whose budget is it? Um, I just want to do two or three slides on general negotiation. This goes well, to Tom. Let, well, I'm going to make one comment to the group because we're, you know, we're coming up at about four minutes to nine. We're, we're prepared to stay on uh, and go over the nine o'clock time frame. I know we still have a couple of questions. We'll stay on until at least 915 so I just want to let the group know that. Okay. So, and go I'm going to do these few slides very quickly. I just don't want people to um, right. forget that they are responsible for having an interesting conversation to, to engage, all right, to, to ask questions. And, and as this, you know, as you can see, this is a friendly moment, although these two women are under great pressure because they are, you know, you can just imagine them engaging with, who, who the person is that they're talking to. It could be the CEO, it could be the current CFO, it could be the controller, it could be all the board. You want to let them see your personal side, but you also want to let them see that you can ask questions and you're really interested in the answers. So the other slide that I would have, um, I'm gonna come back to this in one second. This slide, I want you to read, I want you to think, and I want you to understand that no matter what you think you are doing right now, you are not listening. No one listens like they should. This is very simple. You've heard it, but you should not be thinking about what you want to say in reply while the person you're, quote, listening to is speaking. We all have that tendency that listening is a discipline. You must understand what somebody's saying to you from all kinds of perspectives, all right? And then you get to pause. And silence as a listening tool is not offensive. It doesn't have to be long. You pause and you absorb what they've said. You ask questions about what they said. Oh, that's interesting. I never understood that it, things worked like that. How does that work? So you can use what they're saying to ask questions of them. Your goal is to gather information for yourself, but your goal is to make the other person know that you care and you heard and you're listening. You are not just listening for the substance of what they're saying. You are listening for their tone, for the words they choose, which will tell you the level of this position, how the respect that they will give to you, how they view what has been happening at the company before, whether the company's in trouble and nobody's disclosing it, whether the company is about to go through a change of control that nobody's disclosing to you at the moment, and that might be a good thing, right? Just listening to what they say, connecting with them through the eyes, not necessarily a hard look, like I'm looking into the, cal the camera right now, but not um, uh, you know, uh, eye contact always, but not non-blinking eye contact. 
But listening, huge problem. And then after you've listened, choose your words in response or anytime you're speaking to anyone, truly, you can practice it at home, you can practice it with strangers, you can practice it when networking with your FEI group. All right, so all of you should be choosing your words. You do choose them carefully when you describe yourself and give your elevator speech. But then if you don't choose your words following that, you're gonna give away you know, something that you know, you, something that, you know, you're just sloppy about. You might say, you know, you're never going to tell somebody that you were lazy. All right. So, so in my conversation, I might say, I slept late today and you know, I'm really tired. I'm just, you know, burning the candle, you know, both ends looking for a job. You just probably don't want to share that. Right. But you don't want to say, you know, so I got lazy today. I just slept in. You don't want to use words that are going to hurt you. You want to use very simple words that help you. Let's leave at least uh, on this on this, and move to one other thing, but building trust. So obviously, we know the answer to this. You're not going to do mere imaging, right? That, I mean, you're not going to cross your legs when the other person crosses their legs, smile when they smile, nod when they nod. But what you are going to do is sp- spend a minute or two while you're listening, evaluating the way in which they're talking to you, slow fast, Southern accent, Northern accent, detailed. You're gonna be interviewing with finance guys, but you're also gonna be interviewing with the creative side. They are different people and you need to mirror their interests and their presentation. Today, you're gonna be dressing a little less formally. When you go, if you go for an interview, you wanna figure out, am I putting on a suit and a tie to interview virtually? Or am I wearing a shirt and a tie like this? Am I rolling up my sleeves? Am I combing my hair? Am I getting a haircut? What does the person look like who's on the other side of this conversation? How do they talk? Do they swear? Um, If you're with them personally, you wanna know, do they need a lot of, well, now we do social distancing, but is your sense that they are warm and huggable except that you're not hugging? So what is their warmth level? What is their personal space need in addition to the six feet, the two meters? You want to be certain that they trust you. And who do we trust the most? That's why the picture is here. We trust ourselves the most. So in trusting ourselves the most, then you can extrapolate to say, I want this person to trust me and feel comfortable with me. I need to be like them to some extent. You don't change your whole personality, but you choose your words, your dress, your presentation the speed of your presentation completely for the person you're talking to if you want to build immediate trust. And here is the question I always get. So I'm surprised that I didn't get this question, Kathy. All right, and it's probably due to the first conversation we had because that job offer is so valuable, nobody wants to say no thank you. But if your gut tells you that the offer on the table is not the compensation that you will actually receive. If your gut tells you that you don't want to work with these people or there's something odd happening here or the original promises that were made are not appearing in your written document or there's a little bit of hemming and hawing as to what they're gonna do for you or not do for you or you believe that you want, there is a better offer that's coming or will come and you really truly are desperate, but you don't want to be so desperate that you're accepting a job which will in six months put a hole in your resume. The best way to explain knowing when to walk is a conversation that we've not had on a negotiating technique, but it's the negotiating technique of negotiating from your best alternative to the agreement that's on the table at the moment. If you have a better alternative than the offer on the table, that's when you walk. The problem we have in COVID is you may not at the moment have that better alternative, but if you know that this job they're offering is not going to be the job you can live with going into your second and third and fourth and fifth year, then you want to walk and find some other way of earning interim income as tough as that sounds coming from somebody who's currently employed. So I apologize for that. I understand the difficulty that COVID puts on what otherwise would be 
a negotiating technique. And by the way, you're never going to walk out of an offer um, as a negotiating technique unless you're going to stay out because they may never invite you back in. That's, you know, some people say, I'm going to leave and then, you know, then they're going to negotiate and that could be true, but you don't walk out unless you're prepared to stay out. But this is a different conversation. The knowing so, when to walk. Along that it. line, Laurel, a follow-up conversation or a question might be, what would you recommend the tone of a discussion needs to be? Say you have accepted an offer and then you want to withdraw it because now you've received a better offer from employer B. Well, if you have signed an offer, you have a contract. Okay. Okay. You have a contract. That doesn't mean you can't go to them and say to them, I have a problem. Now, their problem might be, realize, here's where CFOs, I want you to sit on the other side of the table. Did that company pay a recruiter to find you? Will they have to pay a recruiter to find the next? Or is there a deal with the recruiter that if, you, if you're not there for 30 days um, or you don't start, all right, that, that they don't have to pay the recruiter? So you have to figure out what the other side is thinking. One of the things they're thinking in your favor is that they don't want somebody working for them who doesn't want to be there. So I suggest the tone is a, a conciliatory, not apologetic, groveling tone. This that a wonderful thing happened to me. It's um, I have received another offer. I haven't started with you. If you've started, this is a different conversation. But if you haven't started, you say I was about to start in two weeks and I cannot do that. All right. So I, I'm going to have to um, terminate this offer, and I hope on a handshake that you'll be willing to do that. Now they're gonna say, why did you get another offer? And lying is never a good idea because the world is just too small. So you'd say, yes, I did. Now, if they really love you, they could negotiate. Just say, but I, this is not something where I'm negotiating with you. I don't want you to think I'm asking you for more money. I'm, I'm just simply saying, I need to leave and take a job that has offered me more money, more travel, more X, more Y, if they're asking. Understand that before you walk in there and say that, that you need to be re you need to be prepared for whether you simply don't want this offer and you like the other one better, not because of money, or whether it's money. Because if it's money, employer A might say, I understand. And you know, I understand, but what's their offer? Okay. And you really don't want to be seen as bargaining one against the other. So if they meet that offer, right, you're you're going to stay where you are. All right, and take that extra compensation or whatever they meet. Or you could just say, it's not the money, it's the non-compete. They were willing to negotiate this. And given my COVID experience, that non-compete is everything to me because I know how hard it is to find a job. And I, I you know, I, I can't, I already talked to you about the non-compete and explained to you how difficult it is. And these folks um, are going to release me in three months. And that means that if they say goodbye to me and it doesn't work out, I can go out in the market and you know, be looking again and, and not be on the beach for a year uh, based on the restrictive covenants that you're asking me to sign. Again, you need to present, bait, not too groveling, just factually, and you can explain why, right, to some extent, some part of the offer you have just received is more than likely confidential. So you may not be able to share the amount of the offer if you really want to go to work for the other company, no matter what, you aren't going to share why you're going. Just say, I just want to say that it's an offer that professionally and for my family, I must accept. I don't, you know, I don't want to share the offer with you. I don't want you to think that I'm bargaining with you. I just simply, um, you know, need to, to say that I, I need to accept this other offer and ask how I can help you find somebody else in my network, perhaps that you would, you know, that you would like. Um, to meet. I have a, an enormous network of really talented people. So the reciprocity might show as well. But make no mistake, you have signed a contract when you sign that paper. And I think this goes back, you know, it's a nice way of bringing it around to the first thing we talked about. That offer letter is enforceable. And you have to see they're, they're not going to be happy with you, but they might have a second person. The thing that's so interesting is that when, and Kathy can speak to this, when when you have been the chosen one, they forget about how good the second person might have been or any of the pulls and tugs they went through to choose you as number one. You're their number one. That's why it's very rare for them to withdraw an offer. So they're not going to be happy. 
but you're going to be factual and matter of fact and just say, you could just say it's a life, it's it's not life or death, thank goodness, but it is, it's a it's a life-changing situation. I and you know, my security and my family's security depends on this. Okay. So I, you know, I'll help you in any way I can. But since I haven't started yet, then I, you know, I would appreciate your going back to the recruiter and uh, and so and one so. one last question, and this is more asking for you to comment, Laurel, if you can, in the current environment, are you seeing um, people that have accepted offers and then after they receive a better offer and then they walk away? And are you seeing that practice more among millennials? And I don't know that, you know, how many agreements you're working on for millennials. Yeah, I am not seeing people coming to me on, on you know and I'm on a greater basis so it, it it would be rare if you have started a job and you have now access to confidential information make no mistake about this you are subject to their restrictive covenants you start that job even at the time you're signing that restrictive covenant you've agreed to to be employed and you are most likely bound to the restrictive covenants the minute you walk into that office so we have more to talk about than just walking away. So, okay. if, so if the offer that you're getting, the new offer that you're getting after a month of employment is not competitive, you don't have to worry about that. Um, you could go to somebody to say, I'm leaving. That's not, you know, it depends on how closely knit your community is because nobody is going to be happy about that. Um, but you could give them notice and some form of transition they're not going to want to pay you and also be prepared to have, you know, taken anything that you want other than your favorite cup and the picture of your children, your personal items before you tell them, right? You better have anything that you need at home because, and your outlook, your calendar, you know, whatever you would need by way of information, because they're going to walk you out. They don't want you there. Yeah. For one and second. I, I think we've seen on the other side, you know, uh, from the employer standpoint as well, where an executive has accepted a position. And that's why it's so important to have these agreements in place, because at the company's discretion, they decide now. I mean, it used to be give somebody six months or a year. But I've seen, you know, we have people ending back up in outplacement with us 30 to 60 days after starting a job just because it wasn't a right fit. So that's why it's really super important to have these agreements. The exit and the exit portion comes back into it, right? Because otherwise you're getting no severance at all. Exactly. And so you're going to be last, out of the market, yeah. right? The same or longer than you, you know, than you've been right now. So good, really good point. It's, it's a time where people feel very comfortable about restructuring out people that they might otherwise have, might otherwise have a claim in Illinois. And in this area, we don't have much of a claim for age discrimination. But we have, you know, minority and gender discrimination, and I'm seeing a lot of terminations that are not based on performance, right? Are you know are ostensibly based on um, restructuring and you know and diminishment of a workforce, which is quite obvious. But are also, you know, there's also some um, vulnerable employees who are thrown into that mix who you know may not be somebody's favorite, but certainly didn't do anything wrong and performed. And it's very, you know, you, there's a lot of people who are subject to that kind of termination right now. So consider the offer and consider it a place that you're going to be at for a while because um, you don't, there's still a hole in your resume also, Kathy, right? I mean, you're working some, but you start a job and then you have to decide, do you put that on your resume? All right. If right. you're choosing, if they yeah. choose, it's a, it's much more negotiable as far as now, you know, then your severance becomes very negotiable unless you've been smart enough to negotiate it beforehand. But you're, you know, that they are putting you out and they're putting a hole in your resume. So there is money there, you know, to be at least negotiating for if that happens. Absolutely. So one last question, Laurel. So when somebody wants, if they have an offer and they want to bring up this discussion or negotiate somebody, uh, negotiate the offer, should that discussion be with the internal recruiter or would they approach the hiring manager directly? Well, I think that actually depends on the instructions the recruiter has had. My recommendation, and you could come in here, Kathy, is that you speak to your recruiter 
you say, I would very much like to speak to the hiring manager instead of going through you to explain what I'm looking for. First off, I think you talk to the recruiter about your term sheet. All right. You're putting together what it is, your wish list, your, I call it a happy list. You know, what would make you, what would make you happy regarding this offer? Cause it could be totally non-monetary. It could be a flexible Friday. It could be, you know, there's just so much, you know, now, you know, the ability to work from home when we're not working from home anymore, the, you know, all kinds of things that you might be asking for. If you're, if you're being asked as a CFO to do a lot of traveling to different divisions, you know, you could put some limit on traveling or not being required, you know, relocation requirement. And we didn't talk about negotiating relocation. Don't, please don't, don't, don't simply accept the fact that they're going to pay you per policy if you're relocating. You must read the policy and then you can certainly talk to me if you want. Uh, but relocation policies don't generally cover what you need to have them covered. And if in Kathy's example, they relocate you and then six months later they say goodbye, you at least want some form of return relocation. Right. Otherwise you're paying to get back to your, 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 your nest, you know, the place where your network is, unless right. you don't want to go there. So I think I'm, you know, I'd be pleased to talk to you about anything, about tone, about negotiating sooner rather than later. I would negotiate with the people who have the authority and I would be very, very, very prepared for that negotiation with what the business is doing, how well they're doing, what they can afford, what they pay others, all those things that I, you know, I'd be glad to talk to you about if you want. Thank you, Laurel. And thank you for an awesome you know, presentation, discussion this morning. Um, it was just simply the best. And I would encourage all of you. I mean, Laurel is one of the most generous and open people I know in terms of taking these conversations way before you get the offer, right? As well as working through it, both on, you know, going into the your new role at, or structuring something as you come out. So well, I, gotta um, earn a, I have to earn a living at some point, Kathy. But I, yes, know you, I know you, I know. I want, I want you to call me if I can help you in any way. Okay. That's the idea. I, I, want you, I want you to get a job, but I want to make sure the job you get is what you think you're getting and that you can, um, and that you can work there happily for a long period of time. Perfect. And Kathy, I loved this opportunity. So thank you.